negatives. Firstly, whilst Google's invite-only method of launching the site worked kind of well at first to create intrigue, they seemed to wait too long before opening it to the masses. Because by the time they did open Google Plus to everyone, a lot of that initial hype and intrigue had already died down. And worst of all, because Google Plus access was so limited at first, the people who did get invites didn't necessarily have many contacts to speak with on the platform. You knew the person who'd invited you and the few people you'd invited yourself with your limited amount of invites. But unlike other social media where all your friends were on it, Google Plus's long invite only system meant there weren't a lot of people you knew on the site. And the key to any social media is the network effect, where the platform becomes more valuable the more people that use it. But with Google+, barely anyone you knew was actually on it or actively posting. So Google+, Plus was already facing a big uphill battle. As if all your friends are already in a different place that them were used to, where's the incentive for you to switch to this new site that seems to just offer a similar thing but with less people and less posts? And this was just the start of countless problems. In July 2011, Google+, Plus began forcing users to identify themselves using their full real names, and some accounts were suspended if they tried to use a private username instead. The issue with this was that Google Plus connected to other Google services, and many people didn't want their real name associated with everything they did. The most notorious example of this was when Google made it compulsory for viewers on YouTube to make a Google Plus account if they wanted to like or comment on any videos. So people who'd been using YouTube for years were suddenly now forced into using a separate service they didn't want to use just to be able to continue commenting on YouTube. It also meant you couldn't reply to pre-Google Plus integrated comments. The YouTube community very quickly turned against this. The whole thing seemed like Google was trying to piggyback off the success of YouTube to help its failing social product. But by doing so, making YouTube worse. The hate and backlash got so bad that even the YouTube co-founder updated the description of the first ever YouTube video to say, why the f*** do I need a Google Plus account to comment on a video? And I can't comment here anymore since I don't want a Google Plus account. Before long, many thousands of people were spamming the same comment all across YouTube with a tank and stick figure called Bob in order to protest a new commenting system and Google Plus's forced integration. And it wasn't just YouTube. Instead of easily registering for a new Gmail account, you were now supposed to join Google Plus first. Same for Android phone users wanting to use the App Store, and even using services that seemingly had no real need for a social element, like Google Maps and Google Search, you were aggressively pushed into joining Google Plus. And part of the problem was that initially Google Plus was advertised as a standalone social network site in its own rights. But then they changed that and announced it was a social layer that would work across everything. So for example, users could give any website they visited a plus one, equivalent of a like button. And so then if any of your Google Plus contacts visited the same site, they could see you'd given it a plus one. But as some people began accidentally clicking this button and sharing with their entire network every website they visited, the feature didn't seem quite so good. So basically, whilst Google should have had a major advantage by being able to integrate their other services into Google Plus, the integration felt too forced, as by making it a requirement to have a Google Plus account in order to continue using existing services just annoyed people and made them dislike Google Plus before even trying it. And so remember earlier when we said Google Plus announced lots of users and great user growth? Well, now you can see the real reason why. It wasn't that people were joining Google Plus because they wanted to use it, they were being forced to join in order to continue using other services they did like, such as YouTube. It's kind of like when you get a new Windows computer, you have to use Microsoft's browser in order to be able to download Google Google Chrome or Firefox. But as for Google Plus itself, the service was described by the New York Times as being a ghost town. Almost nobody was really using it. Despite technically having over half a billion users at its peak, in reality, this was wildly inflated by users who had to join but weren't actually active. The most hilariously damning statistic came from Comscore, who estimated that users spent an average of over seven and a half hours per month on Facebook, but only three minutes per month on Google Plus. And of course, since most of Google Plus's so-called members didn't actually visit the site, there wasn't much content to engage with. So even if you did give Google Plus a try, it was pretty dead. Whilst Google didn't reveal this at the time, they later admitted 90% of users spent less than 5 seconds per session on Google+, and over 90% of profiles were completely empty, meaning they'd literally never posted anything. Now, to be fair, in response to the backlash, Google did make changes. They reversed the decision that you had to have your real legal name visible, and they eventually removed some of the forced integrations, like the need for a Plus account to comment on YouTube. But the problem is, the narrative that Google Plus sucks was already set. There'd already been countless YouTube videos criticizing it. There were even songs about it. Woke up this morning and checked my Twitter. Went on Facebook and moaned about the weather. And then I checked my friends' updates on Google Plus. 
Well, no, I didn't, because it sucks. And so Google Plus was already tarnished from the start because of the bad initial experience people had. And thus, it became fun to hate or mock. Many didn't even give it a chance. Because back then, the narrative was, Facebook was the cool place all your friends were, whereas Google Plus was just ruining other popular services and nobody really used it. Narratives are always oversimplistic, of course, but they are powerful. Ironically, right now, the narrative has changed against Facebook, as it's now that younger people don't care about Facebook, Facebook has a bad record with user data, and so on. But back then, even if Google Plus did have real potential, most people had already made their minds up about it based on early bad impressions. Of course, some people did give Google Plus a fair try, and whilst a minority liked it, one of the biggest issues was that it didn't really offer much that was new or distinctive from other social platforms. Many critics argued it was too similar to Facebook and didn't offer anything truly unique. It was almost like Google Plus focused more on defeating Facebook than providing a fresh and exciting social experience that people actually enjoyed. And since most users at the time were already fine with Facebook, they didn't want to switch to a new service they didn't understand as well and that didn't seem to have any clear advantages. In other words, Google were trying to take down Facebook by offering something similar to Facebook. When really, if you want to displace a well-entrenched social network, you need to offer something innovative or significantly better, not just your own version of the same thing. The reason Facebook took down competitors originally was by offering something different. And in present day, as Facebook's popularity is falling, it's not because someone's directly copied Facebook, it's because services found something more innovative and fresh that people prefer. The general consensus was Google Plus did a bit of everything, but not much of anything. It didn't have a unique selling point or niche that gave people a clear reason to keep going back. Facebook was good for checking in on friends, Twitter was good for real-time updates on what was going on, but what was Google Plus even the destination for? Now, you could say Google Plus did do some things differently, like with the circles feature, where you could share different things with different groups of people. But although that sounded good in theory, it actually made the site feel even more empty, because you may have contacts on Google Plus who were actually posting stuff, but you weren't seeing it as you weren't in the right circle. The posts were only being shown to a subset of their contacts. Like, one of the ideas was you could create circles around a specific interest and add contacts of yours who shared that same interest. But this required a lot more setup and organization than most people wanted to do, so it wasn't really used that much. Besides, part of the beauty with other social media sites is you share something with all your friends and audience, and you're surprised to find people you never thought might like that type of post actually did. Like, maybe you post about a band you like, and some random connection of yours you'd never have guessed is really into the same band. Whereas with circles, you kind of had to be more aware of which of your contacts liked what, so people ended up sharing stuff with a much smaller amount of people. Also, another problem with circles was nobody knew who was in each circle except for the person who'd created it. So for example, people couldn't share back content with the rest of the circle, whereas Facebook's group functionality was actually a lot better for building a community. And to make matters worse, many users found Google Plus confusing and difficult to navigate. The mobile version was harder to use than Facebook 